Welcome to Wild Turkey Science, a podcast made possible by Turkeys for Tomorrow. I'm Dr. Marcus Lashley, Professor of Wildlife Ecology at the University of Florida. And I'm Dr. Will Goolsby, Professor of Wildlife Ecology and Management at Auburn University. We're both lifelong hunters and devoted scientists who are passionate about hunting, managing, and researching wild turkeys. In this podcast, we'll explore turkey research, speak to the experts in the field, and address the difficult questions related to wild turkey ecology and management. Our goal is to serve as your connection to to wild wild turkey turkey science. Oh my gosh, (laughs) what have we gotten into? (laughs) <laughs> to divert us away from that landmine, Kelly, I know you've been working a little bit on, on some fly fishing lately. This is the man you need to talk to about fly fishing. Oh, oh no. Marcus, oh, no. I like doing it. That does not make me good at it or the person to talk to. <laughs> You're more so the person to talk to than me. Uh, you know, I, I come from South Florida, so I grew up fishing. And, mm-hmm. you know, 30-some years of fishing, you get a little bit of an ego, right? You come to a new system, a new species, a new gear mm-hmm. type, and you're just totally foolish and horrible. Yeah. So whenever you come out here, uh, I'll take all the help I can get. But I think it's from a higher <laughs> power that I need the help from. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm probably not that helpful. I do catch some trout from time to time. I, I actually started in North Carolina during my PhD, uh, Culture Chitwood. Now we're in the same lab together. We've had him on the show before. And he... I, I told him, I, I knew that he and his family had been going out west to Yellowstone area, you know, for since he was a kid. Basically, every summer they went out for a long trip to fly fish and everything. And uh, I was like, man, I've always wanted to do that because I grew up in Alabama. Well, you know, I'd, I'd done some fly fishing for bluegill, you know, got a little popper in the in the pond out back kind of deal. So uh, he took me up into the western North Carolina, into the mountains, and we got in those rivers. And the first day, I mean, it, it was, he, he, he tied the flies, he picked which ones, he told me how to cast it, where to put it, all like just guided through the whole thing. I would have never been able to do it. But I caught a fish, it was about six inches long, and I was like, okay. It was a native brook trout. Awesome. And I was just like, that was pretty awesome. And then we, we got in a couple of his, his go-to spots and we just started wearing them out. And I caught like 30 fish the first day. And it was like, okay, uh, I'm, this is going to be for me. It's just so relaxing. You don't have to be good at it. Yep. Well, but it is nice to catch one occasionally. Yeah. There is a little bit of a threshold of goodness that you do have to be. And I won't, I won't say I'm there yet, but you're giving me hope here. I was telling Will, you know, I spent, couple hundred dollars on books and guides and videos and all this stuff. And, um, you know, right now I just, I haven't hit that threshold yet of being able to go out reliably and and get there. But, you know, I live a 10 minute walk from where you need to be. So Mm -hmm. I have no excuse starting in about six months. A 10 minute walk? Yeah. Oh man. (laughs) You know what I'm not too proud to admit, you know, you can't be good at everything. So (laughs) yeah, I've caught most of my trail. What are you good at, Will? That's what I would do. Like I've caught <laughs> apparently podcasting. They gave us an award for it. <laughs> Don't let that go to your head. <laughs> I, you know, I'm envious because I can't even walk 10 minutes outside here. <laughs> and you're walking to the river. All right, well, go ahead. I'll tell you what I'm good at. I'm good at catching trout on corn. <laughs> oh, right. oh man. Shame. There's no the, shame. <laughs> the can of corn trout. Wow. <laughs> That's what. That's what the majority of my trout fishing growing up, I'm not too proud to admit, we'd, we 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 would try to figure out the stocking schedule on the Chattahoochee River and just go out there and, and bank fish with a, with a can of corn <laughs> <laughs> some live bait hooks. Wow. That's awesome. Man, That's cool. what a what a utility, that corn. I'm a, you know, it's just like, <laughs> it's a, you could just get whatever you want. It's yeah. like the Swiss Army knife of the grain world. <laughs> Well, you know the other trick, and this is a trick, and I'm going to give up some of my uh, uh, secrets here. If you want to catch some good snook, sometimes I use a little piece of hot dogs. Mm-hmm. For snook? For snook. <laughs> See, I've been doing it all wrong. 
I've been trying gummy bears, marshmallows, raisins. None of it works. Did you ever try Swedish fish? (laughs) The Swedish fish, man. You can wear out some bluegill with a Swedish fish. Okay, we digress way yeah. far. I think I think topic. we've gone a little too far. Okay, so we we are here today to have a conversation. I'm really excited about with uh, my colleague Dr. Kelly Dunning, um, and for the past several years, uh, Kelly and I have worked alongside each other at the College of Forestry, Wildlife, and Environment here at Auburn University, where she's an associate professor, and she's soon going to be transitioning uh, to the University of Wyoming at the Hobbs School. I think I said it right, Kelly. I tried my best. Yeah. Of natural, the, the Hobbs School of Natural Resources at the University of Wyoming. And Kelly, we're glad to have you here today. And uh, we're excited to talk to you about what you do with conservation governance and, and how that pertains to, um, you know, trying to align biology and regulations related to turkeys and also how it affects uh, people's understanding of the issues surrounding turkeys. Great. Well, thanks for having me, award-winning podcaster. It's very impressive. <laughs> I know some famous guys. That's that's going to chase us around. For <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. You're not a hater. I'm a genuine fan. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. Our daughters think we're famous, so that's all that matters. <laughs> you know, I, I have said in, in our my moms. household... <laughs> I've said in my household a few times, like, you know what? I, c- I really don't understand why anybody wants to listen to me say anything. Mm-hmm. And my wife agrees with me. <laughs> and it's just like, what what is going on? Like, <laughs> hey, I people can seem to enjoy it, but she, she does not. <laughs> I can explain your listenership. For folks like me that don't have a lot of time to get out there, um, it's just like listening to college football podcasts in August, September. You're itching to get out there. <clears throat> sometimes you can't get out there. Um, sometimes you mm. can't put a game on. So listening to the podcast, it's like that knock on effect of, mm. you know, I'm out there. Mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, you're, oh, it's I like teach a vicarious classes during turkey season in Alabama. So my students skip class with fake illnesses all the time, but I can't do the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I used to show up to class in camo. You know? <laughs> I've never canceled class for a turkey hunt, I promise. But he's so foolish. Well, <laughs> you know that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I, when I was a student, I showed up in camo, but it, it's not as acceptable when you're the professor to show up in camo. I've realized that now. Are you calling me out? <laughs> I am. What are you doing here? That's cool, though. That's like the oak print, the oak trunk print. That's a cool print. That's, this that's is, very in right now, Will. This is bottom land, yeah. And this yeah, is what I, I like that. Yeah, it's what I grew up hunting in. And, uh, you know, I've, I don't think I've ever worn a camo shirt on a day that I had to teach. But um, I, I'm hiding behind tenure now and my camo. <laughs> You know, I started this new thing to try to get attendance up in the spring because after spring break, it falls off. And I say, you know, if you miss fewer than five classes, you don't have to take the final. Um, instead, you get to do a fun thing for your final. You get to record a TikTok video or whatever the, the youths are doing today. Right. And I I <laughs> have a majority of my young men, not my young women, majority of my young men turn in a video of them saying, Thank you for letting me out of my exam. I'm out here turkey hunting right now. They're in their full camo. They give me a little ecology lesson on the good habitat for the turkey, and that's their final. And nice. it works. It works. I'll send you my best one, Will. I think it's up on our lab website. All right. Well, that, uh, we actually have a, a similar thing in my class. Uh, I don't have the rules on everything. It's, it's a little different than yours. <laughs> uh, my, I tend to do things very relaxed uh, in general, but... Uh, I was trying to figure out, we've got to do a plant press. I teach a habitat course. They had to do a plant press. And I was like, man, we've been doing that like a hundred years. We got to do something different, but I need a capstone thing. Well, I started having them do reels or, or TikTok videos or whatever platform they want to use, but they, they had to put all the same information they would put in a plant press into a video about the plant. And some of them post them online and and get just tons of reach with it. They're really good. They're really talented. Yeah. Like half of the grade is just about being creative and engaging. Mm -hmm. uh, And they seem to like that. So good. That's cool. So Kelly, can you tell us um, in your words a little bit more about what you do and and what your work focuses on? Yeah. um, So my lab is called the Conservation Governance Lab. 
Um, that is maybe a, one of those academic words that makes people's eyes glaze over. Um, it's academic jargon for public policy, but it, it's really functional jargon. Um, we use the word governance instead of public policy because, and y'all know this from caring about fish and wildlife, um, decisions about fish, wildlife, habitat, ecosystem, threatened and endangered species, all that. It involves way more people and groups than just the state and federal lawmakers. So mm -hmm. when we say governance, that means we include NGOs, we include the private sector, um, we include all of the organizations and people that actually go into decision making. Most importantly, the public and most importantly for this podcast, the hunting and fishing public. Um, you know, hunters and anglers pay the bills. Um, a lot of folks in academia don't like when people say that, but um, it's the truth. So they have more say, right, just by the architecture of our policy, Pittman-Robertson, um, and they should have more say. And until, mm. you know, we tax things like socks and backpacks and hiking poles, um, you have more say. So you have an obligation um, just as a hunter angler to care about this stuff and to take action on things that affect you and me in terms of access, in terms of seasons, in terms of um, making sure that your democratically elected representatives and the legislature, the legislators that they appoint to these positions are taking actions that represent you, the hunting and fishing public. So I'm just going to focus my answers on that. Um, usually I have to kind of do this whole song and dance about, you know, including like the animal rights folks and, and people like that. But we're amongst friends on this podcast. And, you know, my view is we pay the bills, so we have an obligation to care about conservation mm -hmm. governance and act on it. And there are solid ways of doing this. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's a really interesting field that you work in that I've only gained, you know, worked towards appreciating or naturally moved towards really appreciating more the further I get along in my career. Because there's this strange conundrum that state agencies face as stewards of a resource that they have to ensure is sustainable for many generations to come. But they also have a stakeholder, which is essentially a customer, a client, whatever you want to call them, in the hunters and anglers, that they have to allow as much access to that re resource as is possibly sustainable. So it's a weird dynamic that they're confronted with. Yeah, along those same lines, it also is a, I like the word conundrum because it really feels like the users often think of the agency as against them, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. you know, not in their, not trying to act in their best interest. You know what I mean? Like it, it's, there's this negative perception, at least with some people, uh, that, that seems to get elevated that, that the agency is trying to take away. It's trying to take away opportunity, access, limit people from using, you know, whatever you, however you want to say it. As Americans, we um, have a lot to be thankful for. And one of the things that makes us different from Canada, India, United Kingdom, is that decisions around fish and wildlife are made at the subnational level, right? So the federal government except for migratory bird treaty, treaty enforcement, CITES, threatened and endangered species of very specific species. That's all delegated to the states. And, um, you know, forgive me for a little foray into civics, but I, I think listeners might be interested to know kind of like the constitutional origins of state fish and wildlife protections. Absolutely. Um, I think this is fascinating stuff. Mm -hmm. You forget it when you leave high school, you know, and if you don't use it, you lose it. So um, it's, it's part of what are known as uh, police powers. I'm sure y'all rem remember this from U.S. government. And um, don't these, be so sure. Say again. <laughs> don't be so sure. <laughs> <laughs> so police powers, um, according to the Tenth Amendment of the Constitution, anything not explicitly said in the Constitution is retained by the states, and one of those things is police powers. So police powers are the ability of state governments, subnational governments to compel people to act in a certain way for the greater good. In our situation, the greater good is um, keeping these populations of fish and wildlife around for us to enjoy, but also for our children to enjoy for the benefit of future generations. So um, we have a really unique situation here. And I'll you know, say one more thing that's really relevant to academics more than anyone else. 
Um, we fight these wars that are totally paywalled behind journals. And we have this conventional wisdom in, in our world. And we have these almost political outlooks on the world that just vary from academic to academic. And in my world, I have sort of staked out this position that when you give local people who are on the resource, who interact with these species, when you give them a greater say in the management of that species, you get better outcomes, both socioeconomic outcomes and biological outcomes. This is a debate um, a very famous academic, Eleanor Ostrom, won the uh, won the Nobel Prize uh, writing about this debate, whether it's like, you know, better managed from the federal level, the state level in our situation, or the national level, more localized level in other countries. But I'm of the orientation that local people know more and they care more and that you can show very obvious socioeconomic and biological good outcomes that come about by letting states and more localized groups of people have a say in the management. Mm. Yeah, that's a really interesting perspective. I, I, I also uh, work well outside of your expertise, but have a great appreciation of it. Uh, but I, I have uh, talked to quite a few people uh, that, that actually for the most part, work outside of the United States on this type of issue. But I, I kind of get that same sentiment that it seems like a model that works well globally where you have the, the local community-based solution type of uh, approach seems to be more effective. And um, I'm sure that some of your readers that are kind of plugged into this world are, are saying things like, oh, well, what about the ESA, right? The Endangered Species Act. Um, something that is important to think about are limitations on state powers. So where are states? This is the beauty of the American government system. And it's why our experiment it has inspired so many other countries to kind of take on this American experiment of our sort of federalist democratic style. Um, we have three really important ways that states are sort of checked in their power. Um, international treaties, like we talked about before, um, tribal uh, governments. So we have sovereign indigenous nations in this country and their ability to manage fish and wildlife species on their sovereign territory um, is something that checks the power of states. Um, and then, you know, related to that is, and we'll talk a little bit about this with like turkeys and WMAs and forest service land. It's like when a species occurs on federal land, there has to be some collaboration there. And I know I said three ways, but the fourth way is um, going back to high school civics, interstate commerce. And we hear about this a lot um, with the ESA, things like the Utah prairie dog, which only occur in one state. Um, you know, people have brought challenges to court before saying, you can't possibly justify this limitation on powers for the ESA because the Utah, Utah prairie dog only occurs in Utah. Well, we've used this idea of interstate commerce, which Congress has the authority to regulate, um, all of the economic activity that we limit to protect some of our species, just because it only happens in Utah doesn't mean there aren't knock-on effects in other states. So those are the way that we sort of have a balance between the federal and the state power and limits on what the states can do. And it's very interesting. And being familiar and literate with these tensions can make hunters and anglers in your area more empowered to sort of have a say in the things that impact them. And, um, you know, you can't limit yourself. You can't only care about state regulations. You have to be familiar with the federal side too, because of these tensions inherent in our governance system. That was a lot to process. <laughs> <laughs> Can you say that again? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you know, there's other stuff too. Like I haven't even talked about the courts, right? And something that we all have to think about in the hunting and fishing world is this idea of common law. Um, and if you don't remember common law, um, that's not the stuff that's like passed by Congress and written down in our in our national laws. That's the precedent set by the courts. Right. So everybody can mm -hmm. name a court case off the top of their head. Right. Like Roe v. Wade or something like that. Um, there's some really important court case precedents um, that have actually done a lot to establish the authority of the states to manage fish and game. Uh, most important, uh, Gear versus Connecticut. Um, 1896, that gave the states control um, and this ability to kind of delegate fish and wildlife to the state agencies. So, you know, we have to be on our game. We have to be familiar with the federal side, these treaties and international laws, uh, domestic laws passed by Congress like the ESA, 
We have to know what the courts are saying. We have to be familiar with our state legislatures, with our state fish and game regulations. So we have to be on our on our toes with this stuff, because if we're not, we get our access taken away. Mm. So one thing that I, I definitely want to get into today is, you know, what does it look like um, for a state wildlife agency? I, I mean, that's the scale I'd really like to focus on because Turkey's non-migratory. They're managed at the state statewide scale. Um, but what does it look like for a state agency to effectively work together with hunters? Um, but one of the things that Marcus touched on before we started recording um, that I hadn't really thought about that you have expertise in, and it really interests me, is trying to communicate with hunters and and hunters, you know, having these very long held, strong belief systems about the way wildlife populations, and then in this case, for the context of this po- podcast, turkeys are functioning in their area. Um, and so is, is that a bad thing or is that something that we need to address with the way that we communicate as either scientists sure. or biologists or go ahead, Marcus? Well, I was going to also say it probably, and, and I'd like for you to maybe touch on this if, if this is true, but it probably matters a lot where the information is coming from, mm-hmm. like who's doing the communicating. I feel like what, you know, what we're saying on this podcast or as academics, that information, how it's received is quite different than, than it might be received from a state agency, even if it's the same information, I mean. Yeah. um, So there's a really famous example of this using wolves in the West and talk about, you know, that's like as controversial as something like abortion with wildlife, right? Like you bring up wolves and it's like, oh, why did you go there, right? Mm -hmm. So um, there was this really amazing study done by someone like me who was looking into, um, you know, the human dimensions of how people in the West view wolves, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone from just regular landowners to ranchers, livestock folks, um, visitors to national parks, people who live in apartments in cities, how how does everybody feel about wolves? And what um, one of the questions on this was, why don't people listen to certain types of science that show that the impact on livestock is actually pretty marginal? It's like not it's not very big. Right. Tell that to a rancher. Right. But Mm -hmm. just go with it for a second. Um, And what they found out through in-depth sit down conversations with ranchers was, look, this isn't about the data. Your data can say whatever it says, I don't really care about it. This is a cultural thing. And it goes back 28,000 years to the caves that we find in France and and Germany, the Lasco caves. This is cultural. It's a huge, we are bred to be against wolves. You are coming into our area and you're telling us we have to undo 30,000 years of human culture and thinking. Okay, fine. Once you find out what is compelling people to reject your science, you can come up with new ways to engage them. And what people in this study said was, we want to feel heard by fish and wildlife people. We want to feel like you care about us and you listen to us and you don't just treat us um, like we are some type of backwoods hicks who you can sacrifice on the altar of looking good to your federal superiors, right? Um, And this is a fascinating thing. And I've seen it myself work in other countries and other contexts. People really want to feel heard and listened to. And often you can enact the same regulation that you wanted to enact initially if you have done a good job of engaging people on the ground from the beginning. Um, Mm. One of the things that also causes people to just flame up and riot against whatever you're trying to do is having them feel like you are imposing something on them after the fact. If you get the conversation started early um, and they feel like they're part of kind of you, you make people think it's their idea, right? So <laughs> you have people involved from the very beginning. Um, and now everything I'm talking about here, it's extremely expensive. It's extremely cumbersome. You can't just hire anybody off the street to communicate with the public. They have to be good with people. Usually people who embark on a career in fishing wildlife want to get away from people. Um, so it's tough to staff um, in these types of positions. It's somewhat new. Um, like this idea of a science communicator is like the past decade we've been there. It's it's somewhat new territory, extremely expensive. I mean, Will, you've done engagements all over the state for various wildlife diseases and stuff like that. I mean, how much time away from your family, how much mileage on your vehicle, how much gas did that cost you? And you did it all as a volunteer to do it. 
for um, the most part. Not, yeah. every, not everybody is a will, you know. Um, mm. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. We probably need a couple more wheels around. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm thinking through with this and I was trying to apply it to turkeys with some of these issues. And then I, it dawned on me. I think Will has brought up some of this. Well, I feel a, so a much va- less, I felt so validated. Yeah, it was no, much less was, eloquent. Yes. I was going to say less <laughs> elegant, less eloquent, less uh, eloquent. Well yeah. out. <laughs> I'm going to stop saying words. I can't spell. Well, I, no, I, I've uh, said with, this several times before and I just, <laughs> you know, I just pulled this out of the air, Kelly, but you know, I, I've, we've talked a lot about, you know, predator control as it relates to turkeys. And there are a lot of hunters that feel very strongly about the important role that predator control can play in, in helping sustain populations or grow populations. And it's something that even if we present them with data that shows that in a lot of cases, it's not very effective that they still want to hold on to. And, you know, one of my hypotheses for that is that it's just so deeply ingrained in, in people to be anti-predator. Um, just yeah. simply because we've competed with them for food and for safety for, you know, millennia. Well, what I was at when I was thinking through, I was thinking about your argument that you laid out, Will, related to that. And then I also thought about, well, what, you know, what is our count, our counter uh, or our alternative practice? We repeat about habitat. Mm-hmm. Well, good nesting cover for turkeys is sort of instinctually. I guess from a human perspective, full of stuff that will hurt me, right? Like what nesting cover looks like is full of snakes and uh, ticks and spiders. You know, yeah, like stuff that wants to hurt me. So, Kelly, I guess we could direct it back to you. What are you going to do with is, that? <laughs> is that like? A, are you? Is that a similar issue? To it sounds like it is to me, but I'd like to hear you elaborate on it. Is that a similar barrier, I guess? Because, you know, we we have good data showing habitat is very important and it can even decrease predation on our resource of interest, in this case, turkeys. And we we uh, don't have very much data on the, the predator removal aspect, but the data we do have from some similar species suggests that it is mar- like a, a modest effect when you have good habitat and, 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 you know, thinking about, oh, the predator aspect, well, those are either predators or competitors or both with us and the habitat aspect, what we're trying to accomplish is then perceived negatively because of its potential effects or its perception of effects on our own health. So, I, did I ask a question then? Or, or you, I Can think I just I ask also a follow up on that? So say you're out doing a seminar on ideal mm-hmm. turkey habitat. Um, and you say, look, it's actually the stuff with ticks, with snakes, with brambles. Whatever. Well, it's perceived to be. It's perceived okay. to be. I think that's okay. The... And then what kind of comments do you get from your audience whenever you give them sort of your understanding as biological experts? What are your comments from your audience? whenever you kind of lay it on them and you give them what your perception of, Hey, this is the best way to, to keep turkeys around. What do they say back to you? I, I would say, and I don't usually get that much feedback related to, Oh, that's where the snakes are from that audience. But if we're out on the average person's land and like we see some stuff, they need to clean it up. You know, it's kind of, I, I like to uh, uh, draw a comparison to the way people use the lawnmower in their yard. Like nobody wants to delay mowing the grass because that's where the snakes are kind of deal. Yep. Uh, you know, that's, re- it's more in that kind of interaction where I start to pick up on some signs that that, that could be a barrier. Like the, yeah. the structure that they are perceiving, it, it may just be this visceral response. But I think in addition to that, a lot of people just preaching habitat for turkeys does not have the same ring to it or it doesn't hook people in the same way as though it would if you were out promoting predator control to help turkeys. But why? That, that, my question is why? Right. 
I think we've we've so arrived at your question. Yeah, we're promoting habitat, which, and that's what I'm asking, I guess, for Kelly. Is that are we? Is that actually perceived differently, or, or you know, have have uh, differences in popularity between those two topics? Because one is promoting a a perception of higher risk to the human versus the other one that's presumably decreasing risk and competition. Uh, yeah, I mean, think about like David Attenborough shows, right? Which has more David Attenborough primetime features, predators or mangrove habitat or prairie habitat, right? Like people mm-hmm. just are drawn to, I mean, the, the the discourse over like the charisma of certain species, right? It's something that we struggle with in Alabama because most of our vulnerable species are like aquatic species that you may not even be able to see or... Um, mm-hmm. Uh, You know, how much charisma does a clam have, right? Um, I think that... How much charisma does a Forb have? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I was going to depend on whether or not I had had just gotten it out of a a nice low country bowl. (laughs) (laughs) Put it on the plate. It's got some charisma. I think (laughs) what we talked about maybe before we even started recording about social media and how social media algorithms, um, and, you know, for those of you that don't necessarily understand um, like algorithmically generated clicks. It's like the decision trees that websites make to show us different things to sort of give us incentives or gifts to click on links that then they sell for ad dollars, right? If you're looking at even ad-driven message boards in very niche communities like Turkey Hunters, they want you to click on those ads on the sidebar. They want you to click on ads on Reddit, on Facebook, on Instagram, all these places. Um, I think just the way that these platforms that people do in the past 10 years, especially most of their communicating on, they're going to be sort of these topics that draw, they're like lightning rods. They just draw so much controversy, coyotes, wolves, predator traffic, things like that. We definitely see those trends in our posts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I can post on the effects of this season of fire versus that one. And then I do a, a post the next day about some predator study and nine times out of 10, the predator study gets way more traction. Yeah. Like 10, tenfold probably. And I think that's just like the architecture of these platforms that we communicate on. Like they're completely driven. Their entire existence depends on generating excitement and buzz and virality and clicks. And unfortunately what does that is rage bait. (laughs) And predators, I mean, just look like a a neighbor of mine has a sign in bright red text that said, if you voted yes on the wolf referendum, you can go blah, blah, blah. It's like, wow, Mm. you know, the the type of rage that generates lawn signs to your neighbors in bright red lettering, um, that's going to get you more traction for better or for worse when it comes to engaging the public. I mean, until David Attenborough does a special on... I don't know, live oak habitat, you know, I think, (laughs) but, you know, actually, and this is, I'm getting into a little bit of an area that I know less on. Um, Last year, um, the, the university invited a young person who has built a very big platform on TikTok communicating about habitat in the Southeast. Your show just won an award and you talk habitat. I think things are changing. Um, I think people are kind of realizing a little bit of the rage bait potential of the internet um, in a way where they're maybe unplugging from social media platforms, using them more sparingly and selectively. Um, I think what is going to kind of get people away from being attracted to the rage bait driven things is people like you who, you know, so many academics, 90% of professors, scientists, academics that I know say, the public can go do one. You know, I don't care about engaging them. I write for my journals. The, every article that we publish in a journal is paywalled $35 at least. People are under this delusion working in science that people are going to read our stuff. Decision makers are going to read our stuff. No, they're going to mm-hmm. listen to your podcast. They're going to look at your posts on social media. Most of the faculty that I know, 90%, and this is a generational thing too, Um, are happy to publish in peer-reviewed journals, which are paywalled by $35 minimum payment to read one article. Um, You know, I've heard whispering around my own department, which is a wildlife department with an extension program. What's Will doing spending all his time on this podcast? 
How is a member of the public going to read Will's articles? Do you think the average person who's spending 20 bucks on eggs these days has $35 to spend on a nearly inscrutable Habitat article? No, but they're going to be listening to your podcast and they're going to be watching and reading your Facebook posts and stuff like that. And um, it's I think that's the only way is really yeah. solid communicating by people who know what they're talking about. Um, in your world and in my world, which is more um, the saltwater world, we have some real cuckoo clocks going around. Um, the big guy right now, Hollywood actor, um, going around calling recreational fishing tournaments bloodbaths, saying that people only mm. do recreational fishing for TikTok likes, whereas recreational fishing is the core of my family's culture and how we mm -hmm. bond with one another and to have someone from, you know, not from our part of the country come down to the Alabama deep sea fishing radio, call it a bloodbath. Say we do it for TikTok likes. I saw my doctoral students were all at this tournament. They engaged thousands of members of the public who probably don't even have a boat to go out open ocean and see these mm -hmm. plastic species with fish education, conservation education. Um, there's just so much more to it than the people who have the loudest microphones are communicating to the public. And it's people like you um, you know, not to kind of stro stroke these award-winning podcast egos. egos <laughs> People are going to start thinking that we just paid you for this endorsement. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to have to we're going to have to widen Will's screen so that we can see all of his head. <laughs> oh, come on! <laughs> I'm no, looking. Well, I'm looking well, here. Well, at the screen. I think yours is bigger than mine. What my head? <laughs> yeah, you take so, you take up more of the window. <laughs> oh yeah, that's because I'm closer than I appear. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be deceived. Wild Turkey Science is part of the Natural Resources University Podcast Network and is made possible by Turkeys for Tomorrow, a grassroots organization dedicated to the wild turkey. To learn more about TFT, check out turkeysfortomorrow.org.